They took the train to Batstow and stepped down into a hive of coveralled workers coming or going from their shifts, mill, glassworks, foundry. Mary cut a straight path through gangs of men who rubbed their hands together and expelled quick, frosty breaths, turning to look as she passed. Thatcher felt vaguely traitorous to whose side he couldn't have said. He walked behind Mary, thread to her needle, seeing what they saw. The slab of wooden plant press under her arm, the folds of indigo skirt swinging below the short black coat. Little Selma trotting alongside like a spaniel. October was not an ideal time for his first visit to the Pine Barrens. Mary had allowed, and the brown landscape of Batstow confirmed it. Rain darkened buildings of rough sawn lumber, mud roads sucking at boot heels, trees in their phases of loss, all he despised of autumn gathered there, but every season has particular gifts. This was Mary's claim and her new idea for a series of articles, The Pines in All Seasons. An editor at Harper's Monthly had returned an encouraging correspondence and Mary took all encouragement to heart. It was a quality Thatcher noticed because he lacked it. Rose hinted at his weak ambition because, but the disease was more crippling than that. He distrusted praise and took distractors at their word. Whenever he told Mary of his troubles at the school with Cutler, and he urgently wished to do today, he knew he was provoking her support so he might cement this little barnacle of confidence on that sturdy pier. They turned from the road and tramped down a murky lane where one log house was like the next, all with the same rutted yards, the same narrow rectangles of turnip and kale. He thought of soldiers he'd tended when facing life's end. They always wanted to speak of where they'd begun it. A humble log shelter too kindly recalled on some lane like this one where mud climbed a man's trousers to the knees. Thatcher felt humiliated for the dressing gown he would get from Rose. He would try to spirit these trousers directly to Gracie and Mrs. Brindle, who made teamwork in boiling the laundry cauldron, neither of whom would bat an eyelash at the master's muddy trousers. Where was the marital else ease he'd expected in due time? His thoughts of his wife were a tangled thicket, rose the irresistible opium and the bed of thorns, her exquisite scent, her not-quite-trustworthy graces. She had been uh, amorous the, those, these mornings lately, probably thinking of another baby. And after, when he was drowsy with post-coital exhaustion, then Rose would grow energetic on the subject of household acquisition, their own buggy and horse now, for poor Aurelia. How was she to make social calls on her well-to-do friends? Abruptly, Mary halted and cried out, Mr. Foggett, good morning. Foggett stepped out the door of his cabin in a red flannel union suit and trousers like the suspenders dangling the boots unlaced. Well, past nine in the morning. Well, Mrs. Treat, out for a day in the dear swamps, are we? We are. This is my friend, Mr. Greenwood. Joining our excursion, I need to go back and check on my little ferns, if you will oblige us today. Foggett shouldered his suspenders, went indoors, and reappeared momentarily with a grimy shirt buttoned up beneath the braces. The boot's brown tongue still lolled, a pair of panting dogs. He fetched his mare from behind the cabin and hitched his phaeton. When he had the horse ready and the buggy dusted off with a gray tat rag, Foggett gave a hand up to Mary and walked around a moment, the front bench beside her. Without assistance, Selma clambered into the footman's seat at the rear, still toting the oversized lunch bucket and small shovel she had carried on the train. Her pale eyes faced forward. The brittle hair poked like straw from every edge of her bonnet. Thatcher glimpsed the loneliness of these outings for the girl. Given Mary's absorption in her botany, Selma would likely be forgotten until something required hefting and portage. Already Mary was chatting a wave with Fodgett about the predicted frost. Thatcher took his place with Selma on the seat behind the driver, which was not much more than a sanded plank. Fog had clunked, and off they sped, throwing Thatcher backward to grip the bench and wonder how footmen did not get flung in ditches. Selma gripped the lodge pail on her lap like a young heir.
He resolved to dress her today as he would his students if they were released by Cutler to the outdoors. Likely they would, they never would be, given the grave state of relations with his employer. Thatcher could see what they would lay ahead of him in too much detail. A wife's indignation, a cracks in a collapsing house, and Mary's disappointment for the damage inflicted by Cutler on his pupils. Poor long-faced girls buttoned up in their boots, locked in a schoolroom until they could be handed over to kitchen and marriage. Trapped, Rose had flung at him that morning in the suffocating house as a girl Rose had loved to ride more than anything. She said, ah, uh, on little lanes between farms and vineyards, she would fly all the way to May's Landing, bonnet strings to the wind, sometimes with friends, often quite alone. Her father had kept a little white gelding for her in a stable out on East Avenue, consumed by the debt of its keeping after he died. How was it fair, Rose demanded, that she'd begun with no so no, with so much, and now had to live with so little, when he, she had done everything ever properly asked of her. Thatcher had mortified for all she had failed to see on her behalf. Easy enough for him to find contentment in a pair of old shoes and a half loaf of bread, she'd pointed out. His fortunes had taken the opposite path. It was true. He began in a cramped hovel and marched out into the world, a life that felt larger by the year. A better husband would have seen how Rose's need for comfort differed from his own. A wife had greater wants, naturally, and could do nothing to help her own in situation. Mary turned around to draw Thatcher's attention to the floor. Wax, Myrtle! She shouted above the clop of the mare and shrieks of the male spring under them. They'd left the town now for the spotted daylight of a tall pine wood. Selma seemed to know what Mary knew. Already she held one hand out to the slap by the waxy leaved shrubs they rushed past, whose branches bristled with white berries. She held her little palm to Thatcher's nose for a sniff of the myrtle fragrance. Ocean, lemon, candle wax. The early settlers used myrtle to make their candles. Mary said loudly, it's a good wax. It doesn't melt in hot weather. Thoreau wrote about it. He made some tallow as an experiment. So Thatcher's intuition of candles was correct. He wondered if it came from memory, and whether some of the crones in his childhood village might be counted to this day among Mary's early settlers. Vaguely, darkly, he recalled every kind of broth being boiled from twigs and leaves. Old women was with nothing, pressing sucker into motherless boys. Is it that berries that gave the wax? Mary nodded, a gesture nearly lost in the lurching of her entire body. All four passengers bounced in unison as their buggy flew, a precarious little craft of choppy seas. Fog at their captain, grimaced in concentration. You boil the berries to render it, and the oil rises to the top. So says the rope. What use he made of his tallow, I can't tell you. His familiar tone might have suggest scorn, admiration, or that she'd kept a personal correspondence with the late Mr. Thoreau. Thatcher knew not to rule out any possibility. He observed the passing blur of a forest unlike any he'd known. The tall pines were closed, close-spaced, and even as it planted, with a low of under understory that mostly obscured the forest's sandy floor. The road ran close to a river of deep red waters, an alarming color. Two men pulled along in a flat boat, maneuvering a net along the bank. Fishing? He managed to ask. Fog had pissed out a laugh. For iron, Mary said they're dredging up ore or for the ironworks. Strange territory, thought Thatcher, of bloody rivers where men fished for iron, but the chemistry he could work out well enough. The water-soluble iron, the acid peat of the bog, the anaerobic decay of plant matter equals limonite. During the war, he'd heard men say the best iron for cannonballs came out of the swamps, and his childish imagination had the glossy spears rolling fully formed out of the mud. In another moment, the carriage hurtled into sunlight as they passed through a section of forest cut to the ground. Splintered trunks bled sap into turpentine-scented air. Crews of men moved about ant-like, hauling pine trunks and laying them upright against great smoldering hills of logs. Making charcoal. For the iron smelting, he guessed, the forest closed over them again. Mary pointed out a grassy hummock covered in what she called Xerophyllum cetifolium. Its taxonomy, recently revised by Professor Watson at Harvard. Did Thatcher know Professor Watson? He did not. And here was the small shrub 
Gelusatia, named in honor of the chemist Gelusak. This tossing of names would have annoyed Thatcher had it been between men, but he believed the plants themselves were Mary's friends, plants standing in for colleagues. After a distance of miles, more than five, less than ten, and many more slashed clearings, a sinuous line of dense green grew visible out of them. He watched it as they approached, as distinct as a shoreline, much darker than the pine woodland. The blue-green reef turned out to be a wall of cedars, and their destination Foggett let them down and negotiated with Mary the time when he would return there to collect them. Three o'clock, she repeated thrice and promised the man his payment upon their safe return, as usual. Mary wore no timepiece, Thatcher could see, only her tin collecting box dangling on its long purple ribbon like hefty jewelry. Selma shouldered the shovel and would not be separated from her lunch pail, so Thatcher insisted on taking the heavy plant press for Mary. Off they set into the dim cedar forest, degrees cooler instantly. Seems forbidding, I'll grant, Mary said cheerfully. The place for ghouls, Selma suggested. Oh, that's picturesque, Selma. I will use it. The readers like to be frightened. Why do they, Mrs. Treat? Selma asked. I can fair enough get a fright up at home when Pa has had the drink. Wouldn't need to look for it in a magazine. Darker and darker, it grows as I cautiously advance with an oppressive dread of something which I cannot define. Oh, Mrs. Treat, have mercy. Selma shuddered. Mary set an arm across the shut child's shoulder. I was only testing out my prose on you. We're safe here, and you very well know it. Thatcher saw he'd been wrong to assume Mary ignored the girl. Here in the forest, they were like mother and daughter. Where does your father come by the drink, he asked. Both their faces snapped toward him, and he reddened. I'm only curious because of the temperance laws. Millville, Selma said. They've got depravery and Italians. I'm sorry to hear it. They continued on the carriage road, wide enough for three to walk abreast, but at this point better suited for boots than wheels. The earth was damp sponge like a trifle cake. His trousers were doomed. Mary had hitched her skirt with some sort of complicated tuck in the waistband so it did not drag in the mud, and Selma had worked a similar trick with her own. They must have done it in the carriage. What do you think of the Baron so far? Mary asked that there's more industry in them than many a Boston shipyard. In that section we came through, it's true, she said. In every direction out of Batstow, Bat Bat the saws and the dredges are getting eating away. Five years ago, I could walk from the train into untouched forest inside of ten minutes, pine woods as deep and quiet as they stood two centuries ago. We still have tracks like that standing, of course, but now you have to hire Mr. Foggett to get you to them. Now we must prevail on Mr. Foggett, yes. Was violent a forest like this when Landis purchased it? Much the same, poor barons. The moment they were discovered to be fertile, instead of barren, their destiny was yoked to pro procreation. So enthusiastic for the captain's garden of Eden, Mary. Yours are the first shadows of doubt I've met since coming to Vineland. The garden of Eden might be well and good for the farmers and grape juice borders. Our forests will become the greatest gardens in the Union. And then farewell to the rare floral treasures none of us can save. I suppose we all must eat, he said. Selma thoughtfully bumped the lunch pail against her thigh as she walked. The ground grew wetter, the cedar darkness more dense. Look there, Mary said, stopping suddenly. Halonia spulata, do you know it? Rosettes of sharp leaves poked from the ground. I do not, he confessed. The whorled clumps spread over the forest floor in a carpet of leafy daggers. Swamp pinks, it only grows here in the cedars and only in very few spots. You can see it's rhizomatous. It spreads underground. This group extends two or three acres and then disappears. You will walk 15 miles before you find the next clump. He wondered if she meant to do it that day. Mary was animated by her Helonius and as rose with a new Godie's lady book. This forest was home to her. Think how curious, Mr. Greenwood. It is scattered through the swamp, absent for miles, then cropping up again, always along a stream. What is your diagnosis? He diagnosed this, that she did not use his Christian name in front of the girl, and he should do likewise. Otherwise, nothing came to mind. He looked hard at the plant. I think we deduce it does not only spread by its roots, she said in a lowered voice, revealing a secret. I believe it also disperses its seeds through water. This bog water, it's acid enough to melt horseshoe nails. Yes, nearly.
Mary's eyes sparkled. It would require extraordinary adaptation. Dr. Gary has a theory about the chemistry of it. He says it's the lipids. She faltered slightly, then pushed on. A good example of natural selection to survival in a bog environment. You're surely right. Mary knew she was right. She knelt down to pluck a spent seed stalk while Thatcher watched. The child had wasted in curtsying lessons, the grasp of taxonomy and chemistry entirely self-taught, and still she had marched her theories to the doorstep of Asa Gray. Whereas Thatcher, when he once met the great man coming through the door of the Harvard Library, had gone pale with the effort of trying to say good morning. How did a person come to be Mary Treat? He could stand all day watching energy, logic, and indifference to judgment combine with such glorious force. Selma took over the project of winnowing seeds with the stalks of shaking them into a glassinine envelope produced from her apron pocket. Mary stood and brushed off her hands. If I find other spe species that have similar chemistry in their seeds, it will support my theory. I've asked Mr. Darwin's opinion and he agrees. I've sent dozens of seed samples to Dr. Gray to analyze. A hundred more like. Selma offered from below. Not a hundred, surely. I can't make myself a burden. Dr. Gray's letters always complain of how busy he is. The seeds were collected and a live specimen tucked into Mary's collecting box, and on they marched. She wore the tin vacuum over one shoulder so it bumped against the peplum of her jacket, and Thatcher walked behind her trying to not to covet it. He could not say why the little box moved him. It was not new, but very beautiful, made of pleated tin and painted leaf green. A little latched door opened on the front. He wondered if it had been a gift from her father or her husband in happier times. They marched over trailing vines of partridge berry and shrubs of hearth and under fronds of royal fern. Osmunda regalis, reaching higher than Thatcher's head, Mary paused often to show him her favorites, the carnivores, and take collections. She found glossy sun dunes and pitcher plants. She was happier. A dark, dank bog that any woman or man Thatcher had known under any shining sun. The object of their day was to check on her little fern, Shinsa Shizaya, Pasul Pusila, to which nature had assigned just a few lone spots on earth, including this one, where she was the first botanist to find it. It grew in a plot scarcely a mile across. Outside that zone, it was seen no more. She had looked for it in all other parts of the bog and concluded it existed in naught but its single home. Her search had been through thorough and patient, she insisted, an unnecessary defense from a woman who could sit through a morning letting a plant digest her fingertip. Mary held herself to standards outside ordinary human existence. In the years since I discovered it, we have dug little clumps of my fern and transported them to spots with exactly similar soils and sun exposure miles away, where we transplant them. She pattered her trusty vessel. We take the greatest care, I promise you, don't we, Selma? Ma'am, our little ferns, we replant them so carefully, do we not? Yes, ma'am, tender as baby mice. We give them to the care of nature. By nature, refuses to recognize any right to the change. She allows the plants to languish and die. We mark the spots and return in a few months to check their progress, but they fail to take root every time they are shriveled like this. Her gaze, he gazed at the spot on the forest floor, copiously marked with ribbons, where one of her small transplants had breathed its last. Brown fronds plaintively shriveled so much, so small, they would go unseen if not her markets dangling from surrounding trees. Your belief is that the fern should go forth and multiply, he asked. Mary considered the question. Belief is the concern of religion. My observation is that they cannot, and no one asked, has to ask. Why would a species persist in only one small place? What element of a new environment impedes them? One has to ask. He recalled the day he first saw Mary prone on the grass. They had traveled very far from the carrot road, following faint deer trails that netted the dense forest. How Mary knew which fork to choose, he couldn't guess. Selma knew, took the lead from time to time, appearing at ease. A little bonneted rabbit in its warren. At least they emerged onto the relative openness of the stream bank. The canopy was still closed overhead, but their line of sight to Thatcher's relief extended fifty feet or more across the stream. Is it noon, ma'am? Selma asked. Mary peered up through branches at shreds of sky. I think it must be. Oh, I think my <laughs> Selma shut her apron in a flash and 
threw it on the ground, then knelt on it to set out the contents of the lunch bucket, unwrapping cheeses and salted ham and apples, a pot of cream, another of jam, a dark loaf of bread, egg cake. Meanwhile, stood motionless, staring across the carmine stream towards, toward the opposite bank, where water had undermined a substantial section of forest. Fallen logs lay across one another in shades of deep decay. A person might think we had not wholly emerged from the carp carboniferous era. She observed, and Thatcher saw he could never name his friend with one tree because she was many. The fossil fern ancient cedars and flowering plants joined at the root to the different eons of their emergence. Mary was all these at once. She was phylogeny. Some and commenced to eating a slab of bread with butter and jam. Mary revived from her trance, folded her apron, and sat down on it. Thatcher found an accommodating rock. Selma handed him an apple, the jam pot, most of the ham, and two-thirds of the loaf, which grew difficult to balance on his knees. How much will the magazines pay for your series on the pines? He asked. He'd found Mary forthcoming about financial particulars. She volunteered them, perhaps in her effort to inhabit the world of men. Eighty-five dollars per article. Mary inspected the butter pot closely and picked out a luckless insect, with illustrations six or eight to each installment, I should think, which I will draw myself, she glanced at him, or else I will probably attribute them. I would never doubt it. Eighty-five dollars, even if it took her the full year to produce four illustrated articles. She would earn more than his three hundred from Cutler, and of course it wouldn't fully occupy her year. Mary found time for dozens of projects on a given day, or a hundred. If Selma were asked, it crossed his mind to offer his services as an illustrator, but it might seem he was begging a favor. Certainly Thatcher didn't begrudge his friend's fortunes, but he sank now in the grave of his own. He had forgotten his financial miseries for the span of a morning and wished for more mornings like it. One would think it easier to write for a popular magazine than a scientific one, Mary mused, but I never find it the case. They'll want the proper telling of the thing to be slathered on all sides with froth like a charlotte russe. In the death-like stillness, a mist, mysterious awe steals over my senses, that sort of business. I am transported back through the ages to a time when nymphs presided over the wood, punishing those who shorten the lives of the trees. It's only Heavenly Father that can rule over us. Selma protested through a mouthful of bread. And I will make that plan plain, dear. Otherwise, your mother will not let you come to me any more. And Charlotte Bruce has the jelly on the inside, not the outside. Well, then, Victoria Sponge, Mary laughed. Have mercy on me, Selma. You know what sort of a cook, cook I am. Yes, ma'am, again, the squashed little grin. Why bother with writing sponge cake prose, then? Thatcher asked. You've seen the professional journals pay more. You have so many questions of science to pursue with Dar Charles Darwin and Asa Gray as colleagues. Mary frowned into the cedars. It has to be done, she said at last. Most people look at a forest and say, here are trees and there is dirt. They will see nothing of interest unless someone takes them by the hand. I am astonished at how little most people can manage to see. I admire you then. Thatcher felt a few degrees elevated by a vocation he shared with Mary Treat. How could it not be noble work to rouse a disaffected humanity and press the world's physical truths into its palms? Even the magazine readers, even the pinafore girls, Mr. Darwin was preoccupied and Mr. Dr. Gray was too busy. Abruptly, Selma remembered something pawed through her bucket and produced a bottle of cold coffee. She flipped the wire bale and poured coffee into battered metal cups, passing one to Thatcher. Have you always known yourself to be a scientist? Mary asked him. He felt self-conscious under the watch of Mary and Selma, who seemed eager for him to eat quantities of bread and ham, witness the exotic appetite of the male. I never seem to know anything about myself at all, except that I am curious and put forth, put more faith in what I witness than what I am told. Then yes, a scientist born. Mary pronounced my curse as well. So my husband called it, he described himself a swimmer in philosophies, free to speculate on side, tides, and spheres, while I stood on shore seeking proof of the liquid nature of water.